is Yahweh Church. He is your Yahweh today. He is all that you need. He is your miracle working God. He is your provider. He is your sustainer. He is all that you need. All you have to do is just claim. Claim the promises. Claim the victories that have been won. Because there are many. There are many. And when you have the opportunity, every moment that you get in your life, just shout for Yahweh. Every time you get a chance, lift your hands and say, Yahweh. Because he's forever with you until the end of the age. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you into our worship today. There's a foreground plan. But the Spirit is saying to me, even at this time, don't move from where you're at. It may seem to be just one song to everybody else, but this is what you need to sing this morning. This is what you need to deliver this morning. My name is Yahweh. This will prepare the way for the word that is to come. I am the God he's saying this morning who was and is and still is to come. I am Jesus. I am your miracle. I am everything that you need. That is what he's saying this morning. I am Yahweh. I am with you. I am all that you need. That is all the Spirit is saying today. And if you put your trust in me, I will. I will, he said. I will, he is saying this morning. All he's asking is we put a trust. We put a trust in him. And he will. Whatever that will.
my right God. You are there with me. Father, if I look to the back, you have me protected. Lord, you are surrounding me with your presence, God. Lord, may your people be attentive to your word today, God. Lord, may your people listen, God, to what you have to say today, God. May our hearts be moved. May our hearts be touched. Father, have you in our place. In Jesus' name. part of worship. We were experiencing some technical challenges, however, so we've been able to 
address those, but we do want to apologize to you, and we want to thank you for bearing with us and being resilient, knowing that eventually we will get it right. I want to thank the worship team for leading us in worship, and for those of you who are here, being present as we enjoy a day of corporate worship, a day where there are so many are unable to experience such a privilege. We want to thank God that in the land of Barbados, we still have this opportunity and that the freedom to worship is ours. And we don't have to hide, neither do we have to be fearful, but that we can be expressive in every way possible as citizens of this land. I do believe that we have such a privilege as a nation that we sometimes even take it for granted. Um, the day will come when Sundays like these, we would wish that the doors of the church were open so that you can be a part of corporate worship. So I trust that whenever we have the opportunity to worship God corporately, that we do advance ourselves to enjoy what it really means to fellowship together as believers. Eternal God, may the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, Lord, may your word, which is yourself, be spoken with clarity and authority. May your Holy Spirit prepare the hearts of those that will be recipients of your word. I ask today, Lord, that you remove anything that would become a hindrance, any distraction that would seek to find its way to prevent your word from making a difference in somebody's life. So Lord, only you and through you can all things be made right, perfect. And so we ask today that you will do what you've ever been doing from the beginning of time, seeking to reach the hearts of men. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we continue as a church to focus on your final command to us as a people, that our hearts will be open and receptive, and that there will be a willingness of spirit to do exactly what you've called us to do, in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I would have spent a little time focusing on what the approach of the church would be for 2022 as we place our attention on evangelism, which is really and truly the whole message of our church to reach, touch, and to change. And I went into a bit of details, of detail, sorry, as to what we plan to do to unfold the focus of evangelism and how important it is for us as a church to be on the same page to accomplish one purpose which is to fulfill the mandate that God has given to us. Our readiness, our message, our method, and the mission. And so today I want to continue as we begin to unfold it. So for the next couple months, we are looking at our readiness. Are we truly ready for evangelism? Are we prepared for evangelism? Do we understand what is required of us as we seek to evangelize? Is there full clarity 
as to what God expects and anticipates as we seek to fulfill his charge over us. I made special emphasis last week on the notion that in order to effectively evangelize, you need to be saved. That commences the readiness to truly fulfill the responsibility that God has given to us to evangelize. You need to be saved. In other words, you need to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You need to know that when this life on earth comes to an end, that you are guaranteed eternal life with God forever and ever. Amen. You need to be sure. There need not to be any maybes any doubts, any buts. We need clarity that we are saved and that our hope is secure. If that is not the case, then I will start with you first. It starts with you having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? That means recognizing that you and yourself are lost. And if you die now without knowing Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity away from God. You will not be with God forever. Your lot will be with the devil and his angels. And there are some people that would want me to say that, don't worry about that. Um, some would advocate you will be on the earth forever. So if you don't go with God when you die, there will be a new earth. And so there will be a new setup for those of us who will not go with God to remain on the earth. Well, it is all right for you want to believe that. However, the Bible tells me differently. The Bible reminds me clearly that when eternity comes to that point, there will be a separation, heaven and hell. It says that there would be a new heaven and a new earth. And what that is, is that where this new heaven and this new earth is, is where God will be. So don't forever believe because there is a new earth that God will be with the, the new heaven and the new earth will be yours. The Bible tells me there is heaven and there is hell. And therefore, if you do not know Jesus Christ and you die, do not fool yourself. Do not try to massage what you want to think it will be. Understand, you are, first of all, if you don't want to deal with the heaven and the hell, if you don't want to deal with the issue of where you will be, think of it this way. You will be separated from God for all eternity. And whatever that offers shall be your law. So you need to be saved. And you need to start today knowing that you are saved. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to do it today. If you have doubts about that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to address it today. If God were to call your life quick today, and you can't put your hand in the ear, and say, heaven will be my home. You need to make it right today. Once that is out the way, and you are all right, then you are now on the pathway of ensuring that others are all right. Get yourself ready first. Set your path straight. And then, and only then, will the path of others really truly 
make a difference in your life. And I say this all the time. If I do not acknowledge the, import, the importance of eternal life to me, then how can I acknowledge that it is important to somebody else? If I don't recognize the value of eternal life for me, and what it really means to have eternal life, then how will I ever be able to understand the value of eternal life to somebody else? You are about fooling yourself if you don't truly understand what it means to you. And you will never be able to pursue and to embrace what it means to others. Start with your life first. So, Pastor, you are saying to me, now that I'm saved, I need to tell others about being saved. Because I acknowledge the importance of being saved. And I don't want to die and go to hell without knowing Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And now, Lord, help me to recognize that there are those in my life, around my life, that need to equally have the same opportunity and privilege. Lord, I don't want to go to heaven and see my sons asking for me to cool their tongues. Lord, I don't want to go to heaven and have to look and see my neighbor say, Edward, why didn't you tell me? Lord, I, I don't want to go to heaven and find myself saying, only if I had another chance to tell him or her, I'll do it right away. Lord, I don't want to go to heaven. Find that when I stand in my place of hope, those that I said I love and care for, and that mean the world to me, they are separated from me. And so I encourage us that as we move into understanding the value of one's soul, that it comes with a responsibility to tell a person if they don't understand, if they don't act, if they don't operate as if the soul is important, it's my responsibility to tell them. You know, I will say without any remarks that there are many of us when we stand before God, we're going to be charged for a lot of things that God mandated over our lives that we fail to do because we are caught up with so many other things. And we may find ourselves hearing you know, depart. I don't know you because had I known you, the soul of Joshua would be important to you. Had I known you, the soul of Heavenly would have been important to you. Because you know me and I know you and the soul of these are important to me. Therefore, if you know me, how come their soul is not important to you? So if we claim that we know him, what is important to him ought to be important to us. For that is what the life of a believer is all about. Being a disciple of Christ. Following the life of Christ. Living the life of Christ. Acting and demonstrating the life of Christ. And God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ. He so loved us that he gave Christ. And Christ was willing to give 
of himself so that we can have hope. What are we doing with what he has given to us? Our readiness is extremely important. Our spiritual and mental preparation in getting where God wants us to be is important. So how do we do that? How do we get ready for evangelism? I believe that we should all adopt the same approach that we generally adopt in life. And that approach is, if I ask you to do something, whether or not you are verbal in your response, if, if I make a request of you, you may not verbally respond, but mentally, what comes to mind is, wait, every time a request is made of us, the first thing that plays our mind is, wait, um, why are you asking me to do that? You, you, you may not express it, but automatically, there is why in the back of your mind. Why am I asked to do it? And then you begin the series of the W's, um, the assessment type questions. So, Lisa, move from here to there. Automatically, Lisa, because of her nature, does not get up and move. Even without asking me why, mentally, psychologically, she's asking why. Tentatively, before she moves. Whenever a request is made of us, there's always the tendency within ourselves to ask why. I say to the church, we need to evangelize. I know that even though we know is what we're supposed to do, you were able to agree by asking yourself, wait. For some of us, why is not first? I like to ask why <laughs> um, because it drives motive for me. So psychologically, if you ask me to do something, the first thing that comes to me is why. For other people, it is not why. For other people, before they act a response, what is this about? So it's not why, it's what. Some people are drive to action based on knowing what they are required to do. So they don't ask why first. They prefer to know what is it about before they begin to proceed. So once I know what it's about, then I'm ready to engage you. However, I don't function that way for some reason, um, because my rationale in functioning that way is that I may ask you, what is all of this about? And you spend all of your time telling me what it's about. No, I'm not going to act based on you telling me what it's about. I still want to know, but what you ask me? Why you choose me? Why is for me? But when you say all that, but I can see Pastor Dion doing it. So why me? So after you've done all of that, you still find yourself asking why. And then after you have gone through the details and the content and all of that, and you tell me why, I tell you no, man. Are you interested in that? 
What would have happened is that you would have wasted my time and I would have wasted your time because really and truly, what matters most is not really what it is about, it's really and truly the motive behind why you asked me to do it. And once I get past the why, it is easy, so easy to address the what because the what does not become an issue. The why is out the place and you are comfortable why you are asked, why you are chosen, why it is your responsibility. Then you begin to say, okay, I accept why. Now tell me what it's about. And no matter how sophisticated it may appear to be, how difficult it may appear to be, because you've embraced why it is you, you are now ready to accept and deal with the world. Now that's just me. Other people assess differently. People go with what first because they want to know. And then tell me why. They don't mind wasting my time and your time. Um, tell me what it's about. And once you tell me what it's about, then um, wait me know, and then you go from there. I am wired a little different. It is always the first thing that comes to my mind. What wait me know? Why are you asking me to do this? Why, Edward? Um, it is always driven by motive. And then once you get the two of those big ones out the way, you then begin to ask how, where, and when. As you unfold what is being asked of you. And that is when you are serious about accomplishing a request placed in your life. The person who just snatch it up and run with it and really serious, sorry. It asks you to do something and you do not consider anything about it. You can't be serious. You know what it tells me? That no sooner or later that then you finish it off. The Bible says it's like a man building a house. And before he cut the course, he began to put up blocks, not realizing how expensive the exercise will be. I ask you to evangelize. Don't want to go and do it. Last week, I told you, and I'm very serious, it is warfare. It must not be be taken lightly, very serious. Don't just shut blind eye and run into it. You are entering the domain of the enemy. And therefore, you need to seriously assess and process it. Why do I need to do it? Is it because the church says we need to do it? Is it what we infer coming along? Do you know a lot of people don't evangelize because they really don't know the why? They don't know the why? They don't understand the why? There are so many persons that know what, but don't know why. You see, the why drives the what. And if there is no why, we will get what we are accustomed getting as it relates to the church and evangelism. I say this all the time. You start hot and sweaty because you understand what. And any initial exercise, there's a, an excitement about it. But when you get into it, it is the way that keeps you going. Can I see your amen? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You're really quiet on me today. It is the why that keeps you going. Because you already know the what. And the why drives you to fulfill what is required over your life. Jaya, why did you marry me? You know, if that was a, the, the first question before I got married, and it was about what, I got problems. 
Uh, all you got problems who made your decision based on the what. The what tells you where you can get in that marriage. Uh, you, you know what I'm ta talking about. Uh, <laughs> the what. And the truth of the matter is, the what is never really the what. <laughs> <laughs> you die 52 years later after being married and still learning the what. <laughs> Be careful. I can talk, right? Be careful. Anyhow, you understand what I'm saying? It is, it is, why is important? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what you said behind there? <laughs> I got problems when I get home as well. <laughs> I, I've learned to do the why. <laughs> I've learned to do the why. So the what is all right. All right. So while we understand why we want to evangelize, it is to be understood. We do it not because it is really what the church wants or what the pastor desire or what makes it seems as if something is happening why do we evangelize as a church and as a people as individuals why because it's an order let me say that again why do I do it? It's an order given by God through Christ over the church and by extension in my personal life as a believer. Why do I do it? It regardless of what it is, there is an order issued over my life. Now one of the reasons I believe that I have a challenge with cadets and the armed forces and I never get too far. I started it when I was at secondary school, a young boy and I understood it was good for discipline and good behavior. But if, you know, your era now is different to mine. A long time ago. Um, the world has changed and people have changed and the behavior and the structures and the way they do things have changed. But as a cadet, I remember I went and I, I don't, they did something to me and I tell my mom, said, you are going back there no more. Never went back. But in the armed forces then, the cadets, let me speak from my experience, there are those that feel that they could tell you anything, no matter what it is, and regardless of how you feel or what you think, once your commanding officer issued an order you do it and then complain after, hear me? You don't complain and you do it every year and then you complain. And you will realize that when you complain, more orders will come. So it's best not to complain. There are those that have the authority to tell you what they feel like. And I, I've seen where some, these, these officers would tell some, some derogative things to these, these boys and these girls in relation to their homes and their lives and you couldn't say a word. Uh, have you ever watched any of those soldier pictures um, where the command officer would pass um, as they discipline the, the recruits and tell them all kinds of nasty things, and the officer had to pay attention. 
and I regard as a how the officer felt on the inside. If they tell you your mother is whatever, no, no matter how you felt on the inside, it is as though they didn't tell you anything, no expression on your face to show any dissent. It's an order. And when an order is issued, they want to see it. You just follow it. It is actively involved in the armed forces of the world. They tell you do stuff, and all you say, how high, how low, when, yes, sir. Your mother, yes, sir. Yeah. You ever watch any of the pictures? Yeah. Those, those, those funny sort of pictures that the commander will come up and say, your father, and the sort of say, yes, sir. Oh, my mother's going like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Man, I'm talking about like Ariel, um, Ariel, Ariel? you, you, Uncle Ariel, you mean? <laughs> when, when I was growing up, my mother is orders. <laughs> and whether or not I like the order, I had no choice but to fulfill the demand of the order. And mom, if she looked and she saw any inclining, any sign, you did not raise your eyebrows or put your mouth in a strange position. It was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> no. Let's see, go ahead and turn your body. Go over there, you know. <laughs> and you, 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 you know what I mean. But in front of her face, the order is issued regardless of whether you like it or not. You follow that law? Blindly or not, I said to do it, you just do it. No recourse, no kind of showing dissent, you just act as required. When I think of the order issued in Matthew 28, you think of a similar kind issued by soldiers. I think of an order similarly issued in our growing up when your mother said do it, you didn't give back chat. You just responded. It wasn't about what. Um, Mom was about, you know, about time for the what. Mom why me, you got a time for the why. You just act because you're the church has been given an order. And there are many of us that feel we have a right to question. We feel that it is in our right to decide. We feel that we have the authority to decide whether or not the order makes sense or not. When mom said, do Edward, it may not make sense to me, 
But I didn't. In the body of Christ, God has issued an order over the church. And the church struggles to align itself to such an order because we feel we have the right to challenge that order. And as a result, the church is dying because the life of the church is in the saints who are saved. That's the life of the church. You see, we had an excellent time of worship. That isn't the life of the church, you know. That is the what? The life of the church is when you and I as believers in Jesus Christ can look and declare and make known the experience of others being drawn to the kingdom of God. It tells you the church is alive. We have allowed ourselves to challenge the order that has been given to the church to evangelize. We have allowed ourselves to take the place of the commanding soldier. We have allowed ourselves to take the initiative to reward, to redirect, or to man the direct health that has been given and ordered to the church. Ah, uh, it is not what is stated in Matthew 28. We have edited it and amended it and fashioned it to match what will work for us as a body of believers. The Bible tells me, do not add or take away. It is God's word then it should remain as it is. There is no input from you for this directive. It is there strictly to follow. Why do I evangelize? I am ordered to do it. So don't tell anybody at your kind of Baptist church is asking you to evangelize. Don't tell anybody that. Tell them that Jesus Christ has ordered you to do it. Forget me. Forget about us. You see, when that way is in right perspective, irregardless of whether the church asks you to do it, choose not to do it, it becomes a part of your life. Why? Because you have been ordered by Christ. Once that order is understood, that that authorization has been given there's no choice in it. It is what is demanded of your life. It's only then that evangelism becomes meaningful to all of us. I want to start on the premise, Lord, you asked me to do it. Lord, I may not be 100% into it. I may not be sold out to it, Lord. You may not have all of me into it, Lord, but Lord, I am willing Amen. to take a chance, to risk, yeah. to get involved, Lord, to engage, and to be a part of it because you have ordered me to do it. I ain't here yet, but I understand the order. I may take some time to get there, but the order is clear. And yes, sir, I will follow the directive. 
You see, it is important that we embrace that the order is not from without, but from within. Christ himself making that order. And so, I'm going to tell you three things about this order. That's where we will start. God has ordered us to do it. Let me tell you three things about this order. In Matthew 28, 16 to 20, Jesus had his final discourse with his disciples. It was his last moment to share with them while he was on earth. And it is always said, final words are important, aren't they? Um, we pay attention to last words. When we graduate from primary school, the things that were said by the head teacher as we move into a, another phase in our lives, it resonates with us. It, you know, you spend a lot of time in primary school, but then you're about to transition and you hear something for the final time and you live with it because it builds you for what is to come. The same for secondary school. When you're leaving, you always remember the last day. Now, I remember, there's a lot of days at school, but I will always remember the last day. The last things always resonate with us. I can recall the experience of taking Jonathan and Jemuel um, to school recently. And I will always remember the last moments. I had a lot of moments, but the last moments. The last of most things usually resonate with us and stick with us. And so I'm of the opinion that this experience was one of the memorable ones for the disciples, for this was the last time they would ever hear Jesus, while on earth, speak to them. And look what Jesus is telling them for the last words. Do you believe that? You are telling me to do something for your last words. You ain't telling me how sweet I am. You know? You ain't telling me how much you cherish me. They dare you go. But your last words to me is to tell me go do something. So while Jesus sharing his final words, which I'm sure would have been memorable for the disciples or impactful, even indelible, because when you look at the life of Peter, do you know that Peter did all that he did because he understood the last words of Jesus? The last. The last. The last. He understood really his life and the latter part of his life. And it would tell you that Peter embraced the last words of Jesus. And Jesus, as he departed, he gave a directive that was clear, simple, and no ambiguity at all. No doubts, no uncertainty, crystal clear. It confuses me though that the church don't understand this simple message. It confuses me as simple as it was that up to today after Jesus left the earth and all of these years later, we still got problems trying to interpret what is here. Why? Because we don't see it as a directive. We don't see it as an order. 
We want to do like what we do with everything else. Manipulate it, massage it, and coerce it into soup, into what we want to suit our own lives. So the church has taken this directive, <laughs> like many of those that we've received recently <laughs> through the COVID period. You know, the, the, the directive given here, and you got 20 different interpretations. This body interpreted this way, and that way, the next way, and the directors become so confusing, you don't know how to interpret them. So then the minister has to come now and to correct this one with that one and the next one and the third one. This directive here needs no correction. Yeah. It's simple. Give a 10-year-old who can read, who can read, to read this, and then ask that 10 year old to interpret it, they need no Thompson King reference. They don't need a thesaurus, no an expository Bible. It simply says what it says. They need much to interpret it, but that's confused the church over all the years. Because we want to frame it to suit ourselves. So three things about this directive, about this order over our lives. It is that the church is given that mandate and we are responsible of sharing the gospel because number one, the marching order, the church has been authorized by him who has the authority. So last thing here. I have been authorized and ordered to go and to evangelize by somebody who has the authority to do so. Have you ever come across somebody in your life that bossy? I guess what I mean. No, I'm not saying my wife is bossy. Because <laughs> she isn't. There you go. You see where we going already? Head's gone. But have you ever come across somebody bossy? They like to tell you how, when, where? Why? Why not? If not, they like to just dictate whatever you do with no consideration for how you feel about it. Have you ever experienced anybody like that in your life? And do you know that I got people who like to boss you, both that I got the authority to boss you? They got the right, the credentials. I'm not about no experience at all. But they, however, want to command your life and dictate how, where, why, when, what. I say, you do it, you just do it. And if they can't boss you at all, the best for you. <laughs> because you will not submit to the bossy approach. I am not speaking of someone that is bossy when I spoke just now about authority. There's a difference between being bossy and having the authority. And I find that a lot of bossy people ain't got the authority, so they got to be bossy. Amen. <laughs> they don't have the authority, so they have to be bossy. You see, when you have the authority, 
people are divorcing, you got the authority. I, in my line of work, with all of these different locations, reported to me, I want to be bossy. I, want, I don't need that. Huh? I, I just speak it. <laughs> because I've got the authority. I'm well spoken. Thank God that I am the type that if you question, I ain't gonna get vexed. I may not accept what you're telling me, at the end of the day, myself, I'm going to do what I ask you to do, but I will entertain you. But I'm going to boss you wrong. I'm going to push you wrong. Why? Because I have the authority to tell you what to do. You see, the bossy person don't have the authority. So, you can't speak and expect an action. You've got to push the person wrong. You got to dictate, you got to pull you. The directive or the order that has been given to the church was not issued by somebody that was bossy. He had all authority, all rights, all credentials, every duck in his room to tell you to do it. Your directive, your order to evangelize was not issued by a bossy person, but by him who has all authority. So you don't got to be afraid for him to push you around. He has what it takes to tell you to do it. He says to his disciples, you tell something for the last. And I know you've got problems with it. Because the last thing you want to hear isn't I order you about. Tell you what to do. You probably want to hear come about and be with you quickly. You don't want me to order you about. But what, what I want you to know is that I'm going to order you to do something. And I want you to understand I'm ordering you to do it because I've got the authority to order you to do it. I am required to evangelize because he who asked me to do it has the authority to do so. I don't have the authority to tell you evangelize. I can beg you. I can implore you. I can encourage you. I can massage you. But you all hear me. I can be as boss as I like, you will respond to me. But him who asks you to do so has the authority to do so. You need not ask anybody what they think or what they feel of him. That all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth, that I send you to do it. I have what it takes to tell you. Number two. Oh, before I say that, let me let me plug in this little piece here. The reason why he has the authority to tell you what he wants to tell you is because he owns you. Mm -hmm. Right? He owns you. You belong to him. And so he could tell you where to go, when to go, how to go, what to do, when to do it. You are owned by him. You and not your own. And that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and order and honor. The second thing about the order that God has given to the church, why we should evangelize, is for us to understand that we can't really negotiate this order. There's no room in it for any negotiation. Um, you really truly don't have any input other than just acting. He doesn't ask you how it can work for him or how it can work for you. He doesn't ask you to tell him how it can work out. This is quite an interesting order, and I am amazed that it is the last words that Jesus is here that didn't make love. 
He said, do it, and he turned it back and went low. He leave no room for any kind of discussion. You realize that? That Christ says, do it, and no sooner than he says, do it, he disappear. In other words, there's no room for bartering. There's no discussion to be had here. I said to do it, that's it. I go on and leave you now, just do it. That, that sounds like mom. Edward, just do it. Turn she back and she's gone. No room for discussion. There is no room to negotiate why you're ordered. None whatsoever. It is just released over your life, and you have got to accept it and move along. I, I think that too many of us find ourselves lost in the way of enjoying our spiritual life because we want to negotiate everything that Christ asks us to do. God says to do this, and you want to dictate when, how, where, why, and what. God says this is what is, and you want to tell him, Bob, this will work out better. This order did not leave room for any negotiations. Christ said, do it. He turned his back, and he was gone. Never once were the disciples able to ask any questions about the order. There was no high court for the directive. There was no Supreme Court for the directive. There was no kind of discussion or discourse for the directive. It was released, accepted, move along. Stop trying to negotiate the command of the order that Christ has given to you. Stop trying to tell him when you should do it. Stop trying to tell him to whom you should do it. Stop trying to tell him you're ready to do it. We've got to come to the place where we stop trying to control the order that has been released over us. All Christ asks us to do is to respond. Respond. But too much of our energies are so tied up in trying to work out an agreement for ourselves, to work out a contractual arrangement for ourselves, to work out something that best suits ourselves, that we miss out on fulfilling what he asks of us. I asked a question last week. How many of us ever walk a person to a stage in their lives where they say, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart? All the years that we've been Christians, how, how many of us actually enjoy such moments? Are you telling me that after all this time in Christ that that is void of you? And if we are honest and true to ourselves, the reason why we don't get there is because too many times we have the bartering and the negotiations of the lives of people in our hands. When Christ, you know, Christ says, Pastor Dion, I want you to minister right now to, 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 to Brother Shonnery. That's God's mandate. And he's releasing it, and, and, and Pastor Dion begins to, oh God, you think this is the right thing? But, but God look at him, he, he looked preoccupied. Um, God, he, are you sure he's serious? Um, God, maybe next week. How many times have God spoke to our hearts? And we water. We feel it's not right, it is not appropriate, it's not adequate, and we begin to rationalize. And God is saying, now, but we say tomorrow. And I've learned that tomorrow, Darby, it never comes. 
because something else comes up tomorrow. And the day after, because the moment that was right in time, we tried to negotiate with God. This order to evangelize by Christ is not up to negotiations. Can I tell you, you are blatantly disobedient when he says to do, and you choose not to do. And the third thing I want to say, when he says, go, oh, therefore make disciples, he didn't say, disciples, how do you feel about going? Uh, Tell me where you want to go. Um, who are you going to? Um, yeah, another couple of years and then you can go. No. When he released the order, he released it as an immediate order. There's no room for play. Third thing I want to say in closing this morning is that this order is a way of life. It's how you live your life. It is not a program. It's not an event. It is your way of life. In the passage of scripture, if you are exposed to other detailed books, like the Saras and Bible Dictionary in the Greek um, New Testament. When you read what Jesus says, then the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, Therefore, go and make disciples. The Greek for the word, therefore, suggests as you go. As you go. In other words, it is suggested it's the way you live your life. It's not seasonal. It's not like pop season. And sometimes evangelism to me appears to be like crop season. Have you realized that every time the crop season comes out, there's some industrial action? There's always some kind of, think about it for the last couple of years, every time the crop season comes around, there is industrial action. People are fighting why they should do it, when they should do it, how much they should get out of it. Evangelism in the body of Christ reminds me of the crop season. You always have to be trying to tell people why you need to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. You always have to be fighting up with the church, pressuring the church, trying to have some industrial action in the church. As to why we need to tell others about Jesus Christ. Jesus says it ought to be a way of life. It is not seasonal. So it isn't for 2022 and we stop. A matter of fact, we are behind the eight ball. We are way behind the eight ball. God forgive us from being behind the eight ball. But we don't want to be behind it anymore. We've had enough of being behind it. We are ready. It's our way of life. It's what God orders us to do it. As I live, Lord, you want me to touch the lives of others. The order given to us as believers and as a church has the authority with it to fulfill it. It isn't up for negotiations. 
You either do it or you don't do it. And finally, you either live it or you forget it. Because it is not something you put on today and not tomorrow. It is not every January in the year. It's not every three months in the year. It is 365 days in the year. 12 months per year. How many hours per day? That is what is required of us as we go. Why do I evangelize? Christ has ordered me. Do you set an obligation to it? Do you feel like Paul, a sense of being compelled to do so? I can shut up now, but let me read this one point. Just, just this one. Darius, start playing. If you start playing, then you can shut up. Start playing, Darius. Yeah. Just play something. Yeah, something going. Let me shut up just now. <laughs> I don't want to read this last one for you. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The longer you get, I don't know what I need to do. I can't get up here. <laughs> but this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'll read it from verse 13. And I, I, what I want you to do is to write this down. Write this down. It's very important. Write it down. And I want you to use it as your assessment um, method to determine whether or not you have aligned yourself to God's order of your life to evangelize. So whenever you think of your progress, read this and ask yourself, where am I in relation to God's requirement or mandate over my life? This is what it says. Don't you know, verse 13, that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar in the same way. The Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Look at verse 50. But I have not used any of these rights. And I am not writing this in hope that you should do such things for me. I would rather die, bosses, than have anyone deprive me of this boss. I like verse 60. Paul says, when I preach the gospel, I can't boss. I can't boast about preaching it. Why? It's an order given me. It's what is expected of me. It's my way of life. In an extra. Paul says I can't boast. Look at the latter part of that. For I am compelled to preach. Paul says, I am compelled. Do, do you sense such a, a deep desire to tell people about Jesus Christ that, that you can't help that burns on the inside of you? That when you think, you think Christ. When you walk, you walk Christ. When you feel, you feel Christ. Is, is this such a burning? Paul says, I'm compelled. Uh, so compelled that look at what he says. He said, so compelled that war is me. Deep words. War is me. If I preach not, that is that is deep. That is a sadness that Paul carries. He said, if I don't preach the gospel, I am a I'm a miserable man. I am, I'm a sad person. War is me, he says. Uh, how do you feel knowing that you don't do it? 
How do you feel knowing that a person in your house may die and, 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 and go to hell because you're doing it? He says, he says, whoa, a burden, a stress, a, a deepness on the inside if I don't do it. Uh, how do you feel about not doing it? Does it matter? Does it bother you any? Or is it just like something else that can't go? Paul says, I so understand the order over my life that I'm driven to do it. And when I don't do it, I feel bad. I talk to the church. It bothers me when I don't do it, he says. I feel heavy in my heart when I don't do it. I, I feel a sense of guilt when I don't do it. I, I feel burdened when, when I don't do it. I, I so desire to do it. And when I don't do it, what is... I, I tell you, when you get to such a stage in your life, when there's such a sadness coming over your heart for not sharing the gospel, you are on the correct path. That Christ is called of you. Paul says, Woe if I do not preach the gospel. And if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntary, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward, he asks? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free a torch. Uh, so not make use of my rights in preaching. He says, though I am free, church, I belong to no man. I make myself a slave to everyone, to them as many as possible. I'm, I'm getting to the point where when you can align yourself to this passage of scripture, you know you are on the path that God has called you to touch the lives of others. Paul says, I am no longer satisfied with who I am, but I now become somebody else so that the person that doesn't act like me or behave like me or look like me that sounds like me I have become such that their souls may be saved I am not satisfied he says to be who I am but I am really become enslaved. That those who are enslaved can be set free. Those that fight about the law, I am willing to submit to the law so that I may win them. Look at what Paul says. I am now ready to become all things to all men that some men might be saved. Are you willing to become lesser than you may appear to be to win somebody? Are you willing to become a block guy to win somebody on the block? Are you willing to become whatever to win whatever? Or is it that unless they fall into the peripheral of who you are and the confines of where you stand, that they no longer matter to you. They're not important to you, for they are not where you are. Paul says, no, I am willing to go wherever, to be whatever, so that I may be May God help us to cast our pride and our arrogance, our self-sufficiency, and all that we think we are. Ah, Daria, keep playing. 
God, I'm distracting them from what I talk. I remember as a young pastor. Working for Keep the Word of Starving Salvia many, many years ago. There was this frank young lady. She also came to our church in the school at one time. She was very frank. I love her for it. She said, Pastor Miller, I've got a problem with you. Like you, you mean well. You're sincere. You've got a good heart, but I've got a problem with you. So what is that problem? She said, you are too judgmental. That broke my heart. She said, you are too judgmental. But she knew what she said that because she knew the positions that I took in my Christian life as it relates to certain things and certain behaviors, and she saw it as being judgmental. But the truth is, I was judgmental. And I wasn't surprised that I learned that I was judgmental. I was surprised that she knew I was judgmental. But when I enter theological college, one of the first things we did was a personality test. And way back then, there are many others now, but it was the Meyer Briggs personality test, where that was important and preparing for a pastor to understand your personality type and what are some of the things that you need to work on. And I can see my results as if it were just yesterday. An ISTJ, an ISTJ, an introvert I was. I was sensing, which means I was very observant. I was a thinker. You've got to know that's who I am. I think a lot, but I was also a judge. I knew that. It came along before. She said I was judgmental. Our words exchange my life to this very day. For every time I think of it, I can I can hear the tone past the middle. It has changed my perspective on life. It now reminds me of what Paul meant when he says, I, I need to be enslaved to ministry. Ah, for many years, I, I had pushed myself away from certain groups, from certain behaviors, and from certain conducts. I didn't want to be associated and I separated myself. Now I'm a nerd. I can't win them. I judge them. I said I can't win them if I judge them. And Paul is not saying I become like them. Paul is saying I empathize with them. I understand where they're at and I need to position myself so that I can minister to them. How many in our lives we've judged and we've discarded. And on the way to a lost eternity because we can become an associate and empathize. How dear me. Lord, send somebody along that is just like me. Then I want you measure your desire to serve God in evangelism. Use this passage of scripture. And the day that you feel comfortable, that you can be aligned to it, you know that you are where God wants you to be. If you're still uncomfortable and stuck in on the block, when God tells you to stop, you know that you aren't there yet. If you're still bartering, when God says move because of whatever fears and doubts and concerns, 
you're not there yet, use it as a means to nurture you. Getting where God wants you to be and touching and reaching the lives of others. Paul says, I become so that I probably in your mind, oh, but I love you. I've got to win some. I've got to do the best I can to win some. Why are we evangelizing? Not because I tell you to do. Not because it has been harsh. By God himself. Eternal God. Help us, I pray. To do just what you've asked us to do. We ask, oh God, to forgive us and pardon us for the many misunderstandings that surrounds your directive over our lives. Help us, Lord, to see your authority as the final authority. And Father, no matter how we feel, because you have issued a command that we will say yes, sir, and we will do it with a willing heart. Lord, may we remove from our lives the feeling that we need to get involved and we need to have a discussion and we need to have a discourse about how, when, where, why, and what. That we need to be a part of the decision-making and telling others. Help us, Lord, just to see ourselves as being commissioned and commanded to go. And to put aside, Lord, all of the tools that the enemy would seek to place in our lives to prevent us from fulfilling that mandate. Lord, as of this day onward, help us to see it as very life in itself. As we wake up, maybe recognize that that is who we are. As we go to work, maybe recognize that that is who we are. As we go through the community, may we recognize that that is who we are, that it's a way of life. It's not just seasonal or is it a program, but it's just who we are called to be as we live our lives every day. So forgive us. May we fall short. And today, Lord, we recommit ourselves again to do what you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Please stand. The ancient words are ever true. The same words that were used so many or many years ago are still true for us today. He said to the disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 